First is a wonderful lady who lived in Germany during the bombings in World War II. She endured hunger and other adverse conditions, but she has also been to wonderful places around the world. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Miss Suzanne Zwicky. My name is One day the SS came by and told my mother <clears throat> that they wanted her to become a flak person. I don't know what if you a know. A flak gunner. Right. Gunner. So. Because so many men had to go to the uh, front. Front lines. So they needed a lot of women. Mm. And my mother answered them over my dead body. And their answer was, you can be accommodated. So what happened then? And my mother had quite a few connections. She was a rich woman, daughter of a millionaire. <clears throat> so she was able to get my sister not having to go to the flock. But what she had to do was, we lived, we had, originally we lived in another part of Germany, in Göttingen, which is pretty much the center of Germany. And we had moved to Bavaria because of all the bombing that started. And next to us was the big city of Kassel, mm -hmm. K-A-S-S-E-L, Kassel, mm -hmm. where they, at the time, I couldn't find the English word, but I know it now, where they um, produced a lot of ball bearings. And since there isn't any machinery around that doesn't need ball bearings, they were very much in demand and they were one of the first cities that got bombed to bits. And also Merck, the um, factory that produced medical things. When she was 23, she got her driver's license. And she was born in 1893. So she was only 20 years old. 
and she drove a lot of, well, I don't know how you would say that in English, Flüchtlinge, people that were running away from things like attacks in the big cities. And refugees. What, well, yeah, refugees, you can call them. When the bombing started, you relocated to Bavaria, correct? Yeah, because every night the flax splinters fell in our yard and on our house. And uh, all kinds of things happened. <laughs> so you went to Bavaria um, that night, uh, the flax... Um no, not just that night. We, we waited several months, you know, but it hardly ever stopped. And Darmstadt was one, became one of the cities that was almost flattened, which was a shame because it was a very historical old city, very beautiful. And uh, it was up in the mountains, correct? It was, uh, Um where you lived was up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Then we moved to Bavaria, to the other end, to the highest end of Germany. All the, now all the Winter Olympics happened in Garmisch, that version. When she was 23, she got her driver's license. And she was born in 1893. So she was only 20 years old. And she drove a lot of, well, I don't know how you would say that in English, Flüchtlinge, people that were running away from things like attacks in the big cities. And refugees? What, well, yeah, refugees, you can call them. When you were up, uh, in Bavaria, um, you were away from all the war and the bombings. And the city of yeah. Munich, which was very much bombed out too, because that's where Hitler's residence was, right. was not too far away. <coughs> it's the center of Bavaria, mm -hmm. but it was too far away from us. We were highest in one of the highest. Uh, cities. It wasn't a city, it was more a village of Bavaria, of Germany. So we could, every night we could count the bombers go overhead, but they didn't drop any bombs there, because there was nothing for them to damage anyway. <coughs> I was nine, ten. <coughs> How long lasted the war? Six years, didn't it? Yeah. Until I was 15. And at that time, all the young boys and girls had to go to the Hitler Jugend. You know what that means? Hitler Jugend. Basic, yeah, the young, um, well, I would, yeah, know what, I know what the Hitler Youth is. It's essentially a youth um, group, uh, well, youth organization of Germany and whatnot, basically, yeah. They run for that was the German Boy Scouts. Now, can it, Pugsy? And um, uh, during that time, it was all rationed to food. Mm. And you were lucky when you got enough to eat. And the food was very lousy. Um, the mother of my best friend died 
of starvation because she had three babies, three small kids, and she gave them all her own flesh too. And she eventually died of starvation. That sounds, sounds pretty rough. Yeah, it was. And it took a long time till it all, after the war, mm -hmm. and a lot of our relatives didn't come back home, and or they were bombed in the cities too. Well, of course, my ma my sister had to drive every morning by train to that factory where they were building the Messerschmitts, which was in a tunnel they had built into the mountain, and no bombs, nothing could catch them. But she had to work until the end of the war in there. And unfortunately, it affected whatever they used in that metal. It affected her teeth. And, uh, which wasn't too bad in her case because my grandfather, my mother's father was the creator of the German Dental Association. So he was very much up to date on what would help or wouldn't. How was life after the, how was life after the war? Unfortunately, it wasn't just the soldiers who got killed, so as many, how do you call those, death notifications that were sent to the homes of the men that died on the front came the other way around. You know, unfortunately, your family got killed in a bombing effect. But after that, I, the, the atomic war was supposed to come. I don't know, was there a threat here too? You wouldn't know, you were too young for that. Um, for the years and whatnot, um, years spent on that, or for that, or? I didn't want to go through all that again, and I went to South Africa ah. and lived there for a year and a half with very distant relatives, and I didn't like the apartheid. Right. I don't know if you even know what apartheid was. Um, for the record, could you ex explain what the apartheid was? It was the racial situation down there between the black and the few whites they had. And the man that's now the boss of it all he spent 26 years in jail down there. And uh, I forgot what is his name. Um, Mandela. Mandela. Yeah, Nelson exactly. Mandela. Nelson Mandela. He was at the time when I was down there still in jail. And so I decided against it and came back to Europe and finished, went to college, studied law because I had an uncle who was a lawyer and he said, you can come and join my practice if you want to. And, um, and then I got married to my husband who we had gone to school together, to high school in Garmisch. And um, we had two boys. One is a, 
airline captain now and the other one works as a company that does computer computer Sorry. yeah he's a big boy big man in computer business and um, then we went to Saudi Arabia. Our two sons, one was 13, 12, and the other one was only 10. And when that's when my oldest son couldn't go to school there anymore because they didn't have that. They only had it up to that time, American mm. high schools. So he went to Europe and he went to a boarding school in Munich, in Germany. He liked it very much when he was bilingual. I'm trying to think of what still was affected by the war. Or oh, a lot of the buildings mm -hmm. that were a shame because they were historical buildings and stuff like that. Um, how was living, how was life in uh, Saudi Arabia? Well, we lived in an American compound. And the women had to wear long dresses and a scarf around their head. And they was the only country in the world that I think where women are not allowed to drive a car. But I didn't care. I just called somebody, you know, here drive me. And then I had to take my boy, my house boy with me and he had a big basket over his head mm -hmm. where we threw everything in there that we bought in the souk. souk. It was called the souk, not the market. Mm -hmm. And we lived there for six years and then we had enough of that too. And my husband came back to the States, he had meanwhile made his aircraft and engine licenses. And he was in TWA, which doesn't exist anymore. I think it's gone for about 20 years. Transworld Airlines was one of the biggest airlines then. He was in their main engineering department and our son went and made his he went to the air force and he was stationed in bavaria and he made his pilot licenses after that and They both are needless to say bilingual. And when the younger one lived for six years in Saudi Arabia, he spoke quite a bit of Arabic too. Mm -hmm. So did we. I forgot everything. What? Not sure what happened in Saudi Arabia. Um, after, so you lived in Saudi Arabia for six years. Um, where else did you? Where else did you go after after that? We came back to New York where we lived for two years. And then we went to California where we lived for 20 years. And the last 20 years, three years, we've lived up here because my husband had to retire. My husband's best to retire. Um, someplace nice and quiet as opposed to the hustle and bustle of, mm -hmm. say, New York or mm -hmm. somewhere in California. Oh, I did like New York to visit anyway, and the two years we lived there, 
were interesting, but that was quite some time ago. That was like 40 years ago. Everything was still different. The one place I didn't like is Southern California. Too much uh, my crime to begin with, but too much between the Mexicans and the black ones and the white ones, you know. Too much racial problems, ah. too many. So. Awful. Right. Just awful. Um, so all place all places to pick to retire. Why did you pick um, Josephine County? Well, we had we had camped a lot for twenty years. It's actually a tent and a sleeping bag and all that. And we came through there's a very nice uh, campground on the river here. So we explored um, this area some more. And we found this place up here. And that was it. Unfortunately, my husband died seven years ago. And five years before that, he had to be in the hospital or some place like that. Um, it's actually interesting. Uh, you came, you came up here um, to, to um, you know, camp. And who would have thought that while you were up camping, you could find uh, a lot of this place? Had to be near an airport, and Medford is close enough. Mm -hmm. Just takes what thirty-five minutes to drive there. Yeah, about thirty, forty. We so wouldn't right. have moved anywhere where there was no airport around, right. because we can fly to the end of our life on what ten percent of what flight cost. Right. And then my son went to, uh, who was the pilot that recently, last year or two years ago, who saved all these people in New York where he had to land on the river that goes through New York there. The Hudson? Yeah, I think it was the Hudson. Is that where he went under the bridge and landed on there and saved all people? He wrote an interesting book about that. And he mentioned in there too, he retired because he said, they cut our pay 40%, which is a bit too much, just to give the... Uh, directors and whoever else on Christmas there. Christmas gift and he said no more. And my son went to India and he has just come back. He's been flying in India. Well, of course the price is considerably higher. He doesn't have to pay tax here. Taxes here. We didn't have to pay taxes when we lived in Saudi Arabia either. When you are an American, you live in a foreign country. You don't have to pay taxes here. Um, so back to when you went to college, what exactly did you study? First, I studied law. And when I came here, I saw the difference. It didn't intrigue me anymore. So I went to writing. I forgot actually what it was called. Hey, I'm 82, my mind isn't anymore. Right. Did you enjoy um, studying uh, 
writing, comp English composition, or yeah. Yeah, I have several things published. That's very exciting. Um, it was. I'm writing on another one right now. Another, another, um, another book. Another article. It maybe it'll turn into a book. Poxy, can it come here? Poxy, hey. He prefers male to female. You can tell that. And at first, we have three acres here and a big um, two-story barn there. We had animals here. Mm -hmm. And recently, I had all those little, five of those little mm -hmm. goats that are across that they lived here. But two of them were always out. And I wasn't about to spend the money anymore to fix, make a bigger fence and all that. Because sheep and horses didn't need that. And they love roses, flowers. And several times my neighbor from across the street, he has a beautiful rose garden and he came over and he said, that's enough. I didn't grow my roses for your sheep. And so now they're living across the street where they have a different fence. Unfortunately, because they were fine. Poxy, Pox. I don't know what it is with Pox. They always have to lick everything. Well, that's how um, dogs tend to be, but, you know, they're always very friendly. That's about it. Now I've had my house for sale for a year. I don't think I'll sell it. Right now is the worst time. Right, because the housing market's sort of mm -hmm. down. So. And I'm not going to go much further down than what I've priced it. That's great. Um, you born in Germany, um, went to Bavaria during the bombings. Um, went to co you went to college in... Germany was it the United States or both? In Munich. Oh, in Munich. Okay. Um, so, did all that. Um, sure. And what was your favorite place that you traveled to? Was it South Africa? Was it Saudi Arabia? Was it somewhere in here in the United States, or was it back home in uh, Germany? Hawaii. Hawaii. Every other summer, we spent several weeks in Hawaii because we were all big swimmer. Mm -hmm. Swimmers, you know. And it's beautiful to have to swim over there. I don't know that I would want to live there, but to visit. Saudi Arabia is so different now. My son, who flies there occasionally, you know, stopping through there, he said what used to be when we lived there in the early 60s, it was like somebody had a uh, one-story cabin or several cabins to store stuff. 
That's how that airport was. Now you should see pictures of it. What a difference. It was about 80 miles from Mecca. But we could never go to Mecca. They wouldn't let anybody in who was not Muslim. Muslim, right. But the fish, when I came back here, there was the only part of the world, I think, where the fish in the Red Sea never did they have any anything dumped in there. No industrial or what they pump here in the Nothing of that kind. It took me years before I liked to eat fish here again. Boy, did they taste different. Well, thank you very much for your time. This You're week. welcome. Anytime. As you can see, Miss Zwicky has lived a nice, fulfilling life and has seen some majestic places. Next is a man who is also from Europe. He was born to a Jewish family right before World War II started and managed to escape to the United States before the Nazis came to detain the Jews in Germany. Here in the United States, he saw persecution and injustice and has spoken out against it. Let me introduce to you Mr. Andreas Goldmer. For the record, could you uh, say your name? Okay. My name is Andreas Goldner. And um, where and when were you born? I was born on June 14th, 1934, and I was born in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, did you grow up in uh, Zurich? Or? No, my parents left Germany after Hitler came to power because my father lost his job. <clears throat> he was a, a young medical professor, and all professors in Germany are civil servants. And in April of 1933, Hitler announced that all civil servants who were Jewish were fired. And my father and mother went to Switzerland. I was born in Switzerland, and eight weeks after I was born, <coughs> my parents were expatriated from Switzerland and sent back to Germany. The Swiss did not want to have a large group of refugees, particularly Jews, uh, come to Switzerland. And in fact, Switzerland had very, very strong anti-Semitic laws but obviously they did not have genocide. <clears throat> so we went back to Germany and I lived in Baden-Baden, which is in the Black Forest, until we were able to come to this country. So um, uh, when you were, of course, when you lived in Baden-Baden, um, that was roughly around the time that World War II was? Not really, not quite. Uh, we left on Crystal Night, 1938, which is November 8th to the November 9th. And that was really the beginning of the tyrannization of Jews in Germany. Uh, that night, the Nazis broke all the windows in Jewish stores and burned the synagogues. And my uncle uh, was arrested that night and died in one of the two major concentration camps that existed at that time. He died in Buchenwald. And he was dead before we got to this country, which was in December 1938. And uh, on Crystal um, Night, you were obviously on your way out. On Crystal Night, inadvertently, and we didn't know anything about it, we were on a train going to France. And I had whooping cough and since my father was a physician, he told them I just had a bad cough. And then we were interned in France and stayed in Paris for about a month until we were able to leave. <clears throat> and then came over here on the ship. So um, where exactly did you move to here in the United States? Well, almost everybody who came in came in through New York. And we lived in an area of, of New York called Washington Heights, which is right underneath the uh, George Washington Bridge, and the whole community there, uh, you, nobody spoke any English. They were from all over Europe, immigrants who'd, who had been lucky enough to come to the States, and they settled, or initially settled there. In 
obviously there's the neighborhood that's full of well immigrants. Immigrants. Um, how was finding how was finding work for your father? There was <coughs> both my parents were doctors. They, in order to be, practice medicine in this country, they had to pass a state examination. Uh, my mother passed it successfully the first time. My father didn't. And uh, my mother was a psychiatrist, a Freudian analyst, and she saw patients for 50 cents an hour. And my dad got a job working for a doctor, and it was very common in those days for licensed U.S. physicians to hire European physicians and pay them a minimal salary and then collect from the patients their regular price that they had gotten. And we stayed there in New York until 1941, I believe. And during that time, my dad did pass his medical exams and then we moved to Chicago. Um, so did you, go, did you first go to school in New York or no. in Chicago? My first school was in Chicago and at that time, I, and I also spoke very little English because we didn't speak English where we lived. Mm -hmm. And all my parents' friends were people, refugees from Germany or Austria. So I didn't speak much English. And I went to a public school in South Chicago. And there, <clears throat> because I wore funny clothes, my German clothes, and didn't speak much English, um, the uh, kids knew that I was from Germany, therefore I had to be a Nazi because that's all they knew about Germany. And so I had a very rough time initially. Uh, I didn't need to go to a dentist. I got all my baby teeth knocked out. And uh, there were three of us, a young boy from the Philippines who was considered a Japanese because he was an Oriental student. And a boy, I don't, I don't know why he was tagged as well, was for, his parents were from Ireland. And the three of us who were very small gotten beaten up on a regular basis. And I can still remember my father saying to me, I will give you 50 cents if you come home one night without crying. And uh, subsequently, a, a kid entered my class who happened to be black. And he didn't like to see us being picked on. And he was a little larger than we were. And he told the, my classmates that if they wanted to pick on somebody, they should pick on him. And that sort of stopped it. That was a different story. Well, that's, that's good that it finally, that the beating... Well, well it was two things. Ended. That it saved, my, it saved me from getting beat up. It also taught me something about uh, people. Um, in Germany, at the time that I was there, and even <clears throat> until after the war, until uh, the end of the war, there were virtually no blacks in Germany. And so I had never seen a black person before. I came to this country, and uh, therefore, because of him, and I developed somewhat of a friendship with him, um, it taught me something about people. You, how long did you stay in Chicago? We stayed in Chicago till the end of the war, till 1947, and my dad, who I uh, felt he owed this country a great deal, uh, the day he became a citizen in 1943, he went from the... Uh, uh, naturalization offices and uh, went to the recruitment office and enlisted in the U.S. Army with hopes that he would be able to go back to Europe, uh, in part because of his feelings about the Nazis and also because uh, he was hopeful that some of his family was still alive. They weren't. Uh, he did not get to do that. He ended up in uh, Alabama and, he, as he jokingly said, he fought the Civil War. Uh, we moved after the, he got out of the Army. <clears throat> he went to work for the Veterans Administration, and we lived in Colorado for the next approximately three years. And then my folks moved back to New York. In Colorado, how was life there really? Just it's wonderful. I had no, no knowledge. I mean, I have little things. <clears throat> Nothing ever happened to me. Um, being Jewish, if you don't live in a community that has a fair number of Jews, you're probably not recognized. I'm not from a religious family. I'm what's called a secular Jew. Uh, by Hitler's definition, I was Jewish because I had four Jewish grandparents. In Judaism, it's a, a matriarchy, and the uh, uh, religion is passed from the mother. 
So Hitler's definition is different than the definition, than the, the religious de definition. Um, oh, I can remember once in junior high school, we went to play basketball in, an, in a suburb of Denver, and we were, uh, <clears throat> I was surprised to see a sign that said this, was, this community was restricted, which meant that if you were not wasps, you couldn't get in. In other words, if you were black or Asian or Jewish, uh, the, you couldn't purchase a home there. And uh, never, I, that was my one exposure at that time. Many years later, I went uh, to Colorado for a meeting, and a friend of mine said, let's go out to see some friends of hers. And we went to that same place, and I had to chuckle because as a youth, I was not allowed to go in there. But no, most of my life, I've had very, very little uh, experience with prejudice. Um, and it's not really been a big deal. I was kicked out of a swimming club where my folks had a house because it was private and they were discriminatory. But other than that, not really. Uh, I'm also a Germanophile. Um, I go back to Germany at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. I went back as soon as I could after the war because I have a cousin, a girl who is the same age as I am, and she and I were raised together until we were five, and she uh, survived in Germany. Her father is the gentleman that was killed in Buchenwald. Her mother was Protestant. Um, she was in a girl's school, in, uh, what's called an internat in German, and the mistress of that school uh, took in kids who were half Jews and Jewish kids and was able to uh, bring them through the war, and they survived. <clears throat> uh, Germany is still, it's not my home, but I have a strong attachment to it, a lot of smells, tastes, things like that. And as I say, she and her family live in, in Germany, and so I go back and I will be going back on the 6th of June this year. Um, I went to school in Germany after the war. I went to the university. I went uh, of Munich. Uh, I also went to Germany on my sabbatical when I was still uh, active as a professor. Um, the only little anecdote I can tell you about that is that I was in a lecture hall at the University of Munich as a student and uh, I there were, the lecture hall was about a thousand people, and I was up about halfway up the seating area, and I looked down just at the time that the professor announced that he was making, starting a new chapter, and as I looked down, I saw 13 rows of students, all with their pencils poised over a clean white piece of paper. And unfortunately, I smiled. I didn't laugh out loud, but I smiled. And he happened to look at me at that time, and in his own way, uh, was offended and screamed at me, get out, nobody laughs in my class. And I wasn't sure he was talking to me and uh, I looked around and he said, yes, you the, sitting next to the girl in the red dress and sure enough, there was a girl sitting in a red dress next to me. Uh, he stared at me and I stared at him for approximately maybe 30, 45 seconds. And then he, he continued his lecture. At the end of the lecture, a group of the students rushed up to me and said, you know, if you want to take your examinations here, you'll never pass them because he will never pass you. And in Germany, you only take, your, take exams at the university when you finished your curriculum, right. not just the course. And I said no, pointed out to them that I was a foreign student, that I was not going to take my exams here, and it made no difference to me. Then they said to me, well, how come you speak such good German? And I explained to them, and since these were young people who were probably born during or right before the war and had never seen a live Jew before, they, were, uh, they, I, they looked at me as if I were an alien from Mars right. because they had only seen the caricatures that are printed in, in all their textbooks yeah, and things like that. And they had never seen one. And so their reaction was, oh my gosh, what is this? Tell us more. And unfortunately, they wanted to know about Judaism and I could tell them nothing because I'm not really religious. They had a van come up and two soldiers, one a private and the other one a sergeant, and they uh, were reviewing or checking off a list of what we could take. 
and they took a break for lunch. And one of the sergeant said to my parents, um, I'm leaving the van open and don't leave any of your Jewish junk here in Germany. Well, either he was the dumbest or the nicest guy in the world, I don't know which, but we were able to take things out, medical stuff that we were able to sell in this country when we came here and able to live off that money because it was very difficult. Um, I guess you'd want to know how we got out. When we came back from Switzerland, we had no hope of leaving Germany. There just wasn't any way. <clears throat> we had a friend who was a furniture importer who imported furniture from the U.S. from New England. And what he <clears throat> did was he wrote all his business contacts in the United States and asked them to provide him with visas, which were a, like a passport to let you come into a country, and affidavits. And the affidavits were basically a document which said that the, uh, the recipient of this affidavit, that they would be responsible for that person or persons if they couldn't make a living. Um, he was generous. He gave those to many of his friends and people who he thought might not survive in Germany. And he himself did not take one, and actually he did survive in Germany. He was not Jewish. I have no idea other than that the affidavit and the visa came from somebody in New England. I uh, never heard their name mentioned, uh, never had any contact, and that's how we got out. Without that, you couldn't leave. It was very, very difficult to come into the United States. There were quotas in those times, and they were very strictly enforced, and uh, they were very racially discriminatory. So anyway, we, we were able to come here because of that. And I uh, was very fortunate. My chances of survival based on my age were less than 7% because uh, there was no use for a five-year-old or four-year-old in the Nazi scheme of things. Uh, I would not have survived in the concentration camp, most likely. Um, and that experience of having... Uh, or, how, or let's look at it this way. As I grew up, I realized how lucky I was. And uh, because of that, I have no fear. And I've taken part in a lot of activities uh, based on my principles, um, oftentimes doing things that my wife doesn't particularly care for because it is risky. And I have done that most of my life. Um, it's not, uh, having no fear is an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, it's not the smartest thing to have, but I was heavily involved in the civil rights movement um, and in demonstrations against both Korea and Vietnam and a few other things. Mm -hmm. Exactly what sort of activities did you do during the civil rights movement? My, well, <clears throat> I was a student at that time, mm -hmm. and a lot of students got involved in things. I drove a, a, a car during Martin Luther King's bus boycotts in, Mon in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, got, was involved in voter registration and in integrating schools, and spent one night <laughs> in a jail in Alabama, um, but uh, with a whole bunch of other civil rights workers. So uh, it was not very dangerous, let's put it that way. But the, the real breaking point came when uh, the killing of, of oh, sh Goodwin, Schwerner, and Till in Philadelphia, Mississippi, when the FBI decided it was time to stop the, the, the harassment. And <clears throat> that made it much easier to be a civil rights worker in the South. However, we did things that, in, as I've grown older, I can't believe that we had the audacity to do, and that was to take kids, ask parents to give us their little elementary school children, and we would integrate the schools with them. And these were little black children. And luckily nothing happened, but uh, uh, there was a story, and I was not present at this time, of a young, of a group of, of civil rights workers from New England, uh, little, nice little co-eds from Vassar, and supposedly, I, I believe the story to be true, uh, the, one of the girls was talking with a, a black high school student, or maybe even college student, and gave him a hug and he didn't survive. He was uh, the, 
the community uh, took care of him. And it wasn't the black community. So he did not survive. Uh, my experiences were moderate. I mean, uh, being hassled and being yelled at and screamed at is, you know, sticks and stones. Yeah. But names can't, can't do anything to you. Um, I've had people take a swing at me, but, and that was in, a <coughs> in Washington, D.C., and trying to uh, open up the housing market around Washington, D.C. And I lived in Montgomery County, and we had little cards that asked people that if they would sell their home, would they list it openly to anybody who could buy it. And I was walking down the street, knocking on doors, and one of my neighbors, when I knocked on his door, hit me face on through his screen door. It wrecked his screen door. Uh, but uh, they were very adamant. And when I left that area and I was to sell my house, my neighbors were so concerned that I would sell to someone who was black that they uh, th thought very seriously of buying my house from me so that they could control who was living in the area. I tried very hard to, I had one telephone call from somebody who I think was black, um, who never showed up. And I ultimately sold to a family from Minnesota with four little blonde-haired children, and my neighbors were ecstatic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, life is very interesting. It, it makes you think about those kinds of things and take part in things that you might not otherwise think of. Having seen the ultimate in what I would consider discrimination, uh, which was what which happened in Europe, um, it just carries over in my life. <clears throat> As far as talking about the Holocaust or my, pers you know, my personal feelings, uh, I started doing that about 20, 20 years ago. Uh, there are less than 50,000 of us left in this country. There may be more across the world, but uh, we're dying out. And the message, I think, is worth repeating, uh, and therefore it is worthwhile for us uh, those of us who have survived to speak out. It is indeed a good, a good thing to. I hope so. People, that people know about exactly what happened. When I speak, and I've spoken at a lot of high schools, junior highs, groups, and so on, I was shocked to find out when I first started talking to high school students that about 15% of them, or about 40% of them, didn't know what the Holocaust was, and about 15% didn't believe it. So uh, I, that was very interesting to me. Um, I, I will say that I have not felt disrespected by any of the students that I've talked to, even if they themselves did not happen to believe me. Uh, they usually were perfectly well-mannered and so on. Um, it's not a problem as far as I can see. Um, the, 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 the tragedy is that <clears throat> Second World War, most of the kids you ask them about the war, they'll tell you it's Vietnam or now maybe Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, the war doesn't mean anything to them. The Second World War, barely, they barely know what it was because it's maybe their grandparents who were involved in it. And so the, the, the impact of the Second World War really doesn't have much impact on young people. Yeah, more recent, more and the, tr the, the thing is that the history books keep growing, and uh, in some history books, the Holocaust warrants about a paragraph. Mm. It's the way it happens. So you're going across the country, um, civil rights. When did you finally settle down someplace? Oh, I, no, I settled when my folks moved from Chicago to Colorado, then back to New York, and... Uh, I went off to college mm -hmm. and went to graduate school and postdoctoral fellowships. And then I finally, I guess you'd call it settled down. I settled in uh, Davis, California for five years as a faculty member uh, in the medical school. And then I went to the University of Arizona College of Medicine till 1991 when I retired and came up here. And uh, I've lived here almost except for three years since then. Um, and be very honest with you. It's one of the nicest places in the world to live. <clears throat> so we've enjoyed it, and I probably will die here. <laughs> um, how exactly did you find uh, Grants Pass? Or like, 
Were you passing through or? I, when I graduated from college, a group of my friends who were in theater came up here to the Shakespeare Festival to work as extras or actors in the Ashland in the Shakespeare Festival. And at that time, uh, students participated in the, in the staging and so on. Uh, there were very few equity players. And so I came up here, I hitchhiked up here from California to, to see them and uh, also went to some of the plays here. And since about 1956, I have been a member and supported the Shakespeare Festival. And uh, when I was about to retire, because I couldn't get a sabbatical from the University of Arizona, um, this was one of the places we looked at and we ended up here, although not in Ashland, uh, in Williams. Mm -hmm. And there I spent 10 years as a horse trainer. And then when I became 65, it was clear that my body would not survive it. So we got rid of the ranch and uh, uh, then I became a retiree. Um, you said you, between 91 or 92, 91. And now there was a three-year interim where you... Lived Went to Nashville. Nashville. Lived in Nashville for three years. Ah, Nashville. Yeah. But uh, you know, one of the things, as I say, I started speaking about the Holocaust when we moved up here. Uh, we put on the Anne Frank exhibit here in Grants Pass, um, the, what was then known as the Human Rights Alliance. And we put that on here. And we had about 3,700 people go through the exhibit. And... Uh, to my surprise, and to my wife's surprise, I got one piece of hate mail. And uh, I was very pleased. Um, we would put on programs at uh, RCC uh, every Tuesday and Thursday night. We had survivors. We had somebody who said he knew, had known Anne Frank. Turned out he was a charlatan. We had uh, a skinhead, not a skinhead, a uh, guy from, who had been a member of the Aryan Nation talk about discrimination. Uh, we had uh, concentration camp, um, not survivors, but soldiers, guys who had, who had opened concentration camps. We had all kinds of speakers. We had very, very good attendance. And uh, it, it was a very positive experience. And I, the part of that exhibit, I take around with me to high school, some 40 panels called Courage to Remember. And when I go to speak to a high school or any other group, I put that exhibit up for a week before I come in to speak. And then I uh, come in and talk about the Holocaust to the youngsters or people, whoever it is. I've talked to people in, in nursing homes, not nursing homes, but retirement communities. I'm not quite sure why anybody would want to, in the retirement community, want to hear about it, but that's okay. Well, it's, I, I attribute it to more, um, they want to still learn learn things I mean, either that or some kind learn. of a peculiar nos nostalgia i'm not sure well, that too uh, anyway they i've done it and it's been fun um there were a few survivors here i knew one of them uh, she was a little different uh, she was a had come from poland she was a in 1938 <clears throat> hitler tried to push all the polish people who lived in germany back into poland and they lived in a no-man's land between Poland and Germany during that period of time. She was one of those. Uh, ultimately, she survived the war by marrying a German officer, a Nazi officer. Um, she lived here in the, in the valley. And there is supposedly, there was a, uh, a woman over in Illinois Valley, who I, his name I don't know and have never met, who was a Russian survivor. Um, I don't even know if she's still alive. I have no idea. I really don't know, to be honest with you, any other survivors. Although I read, no, well, there, there are not many. If there are any in this area, there are not very many. And if you think about spreading 50,000 people across the country, many of them who are in their late 80s, they're all in nursing homes or retirement communities. So that makes it a little tough. Um, I, I belong to some organizations that help support them. And uh, there's one called The Gathering, which is a magazine that comes out about once a month and uh, tells you what's going on. And I look through the names all the time. Rarely, if ever, do I find a name that I even recognize. There are still people searching for 
re friends and relatives who uh, got lost in the Holocaust. So, as a retiree, what do you do now? <laughs> uh, in, I'm in my fourth career. Uh, I work at North Valley High School. I'm the Aspire coordinator and sort of an adjunct counselor. I work for a program, also another program called Gear Up, um, and work with students, particularly those students who are looking toward higher education <laughs> and uh, counsel students and so on. And I get a real bang out of it. I think the kids are great, and I have a wonderful time doing it, and uh, it gives me something that gives me satisfaction. And hopefully helps them. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it's good to have some help too. To well, it's also interesting. Interesting. We have in a school of six hundred students, we have one counselor. Yikes! And he cannot cover all those students. Right. So I pick up a lot of that slack. And most of mine are not all, but most of mine are kids who are going on for higher education. But I have some that I worry about. I don't know what will ever happen to them. They have no goals, and it's going to be tough. Still, it's very good and productive. I enjoy it. I, yeah. You know, I, I do it because it's something that gives me pleasure, mm -hmm. not because of I want anything from it. Right. Um, they, I, I get paid a stipend, which I put in the scholarship fund. Mm -hmm. I don't use that. When we were doing the uh, Holocaust exhibit and the Anne Frank exhibit here, uh, whenever we took young students through there, we gave them the Star of David, which is what was sewn on all Jews' uh, outer clothing. And this one has a poem written by a man by the name of Pastor Martin Niemuller, who's a Protestant minister who did not survive the war. And he said that made the following, or wrote the following poem. First they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. And that sort of epitomizes my feeling about why I speak. Because you, if you don't speak out, then no, one will speak out then no one will speak out for me, although I doubt that I need anybody to speak out for me anymore. But yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so this has sort of been a credo that I have used in most of my life. That's, and that, uh, that's definitely a good, yeah. and that's definitely a good poem. Yeah. I, I really should translate it into German. I never, I've not, I never thought of doing that, but sometime I should do it. it it'd, be, it'd, be, it'd be nice to hear. I don't think I can do it ad, just well, not ad -lib, spontaneously. Ad -libbing not, would, uh, well, it, I could, but it'd be difficult. Right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's uh, much of my life. Um, I love it here. I, you know, I'm happy to go anywhere, and I have gone a lot of places in the States to talk about it and... Uh, as I say, I, I work in the school system. Uh, not, I don't know how many of the kids know my history. Not many. Uh, you, I don't talk about it. It's not, it's not a factor in what I do. Right. So uh, my major function is to encourage them to do what they want to do mm -hmm. so that they have the opportunities and ahead of them. Doctors, yeah. Means to do what they yeah. Want to do. Um, that's, that's all. In times of adversity, great achievement comes from those who persevere. This is greatly evidenced by Mr. Goldner's role in the civil rights movement and his courage to speak about the Holocaust. Our third and final great American served as a radio man in the naval B-24 Liberators in World War II over the Pacific. As he is a World War II veteran, it is a real honor to hear his story, as the number of veterans from World War II is rapidly declining every day. It is my honor to present to you Mr. Arthur Adair. Could you please say your name for the record? Arthur C. Adair. All right. And uh, Mr. Adair, where and when were you born? I was born September 4th, 1923 in Detroit, Michigan. So how was life like in your town in Detroit? Uh, 
I was young, so I didn't notice too much. I mean, I had a good life. My father worked through the Depression and that, and we had, in fact, I lost my mother at early age. I never really knew her, but we lived in boarding houses and so forth. Do you quite remember um, what it was like serving in the Boy Scouts, or? Well, I was uh, <clears throat> 16 or 15 or 16, something like that, and like I was telling you, the Elks Club Lodge 99 of Los Angeles sponsored it. Mm -hmm. And they had a gym and everything that we had and swimming pools and so forth. And, and they would take us out on outings, outings. And one own fact, they took us to one of the movie studios. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the um, Elk members was a pilot. He says, if any of you want to ride, come out to the airport and we'll take you for a ride. Well, I went out to the airport and I flew in this little commercial airplane. And that reminds me, after the war, they were getting rid of airplanes. I was stationed at Mojave, California, and this single engine, like a, like a private plane, it was uh, uh, like the skipper would use or something like that. Well, one of the pilots was taking it up to the, uh, can't think of the town, it's north of Bakersfield, but anyway, he asked me if I want to fight along, fly along with him. And I sit in the co-pilot seat. So we take off and we're flying towards Bakersfield and the Tehachapi Mountains were awful rough. And no sooner gets born, he tells me to take it. I didn't know how to fly a single airplane. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting kicked out of me, trying to hang on to it and, and <clears throat> by Bakerfield. Mm -hmm. He says, well, I'll take over the controls. And so he did. And he says, you want to have a little fun? I said, oh, why not? Tighten your seat belt. Mm -hmm. He did a loop. <laughs> 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 and then we landed up at uh, Airstrip up north, air surplus border or something. Then they had a JRB that took us back to Mojave. Uh, war broke out. Um, how did your family react when all that stuff was going on in uh, uh, Europe? Well, fortunately, when I graduated from high school in June of 41, mm -hmm. I tried to get in the Navy and the Army and the Marine Corps, but nobody would take me. I was seven, 17 years old. But in September, I, I turned 18 and I went down to the Navy and they accepted me and they had to sign up for six years. And uh, I enlisted January 25th, 1941 for six years. Mm -hmm. um, how about, well, when we were finally attacked at Pearl Harbor, what was the, what was your initial reaction really? I know it was, I know really a, tragedy and whatnot. But, uh. Well, I was in radio school in Los Angeles at Lilac Terrace, and I happened to be the, our particular company secretary, mm -hmm. so I had my name usually on Saturday and Sunday for Liberty. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in Los Angeles on Liberty on Sunday when Pearl Harbor happened. About 10 o'clock, I found out about Pearl Harbor, and they said all military personnel return to your base. Well, I didn't manage to get back until about six o'clock that evening. Yikes. And uh, they told me to go to your bunk. That was it. Nothing beyond that? Nothing. Uh, in fact, I lived in LA and I was out with uh, a lot of my friends uh, in Los Angeles. What was exactly going through your mind, really? Was it uh, sort of a foreboding feeling that uh, we were about to get into war? Or? Yeah, well, really, I didn't. Uh, thinking about it, uh, you know, it, it happened and it happened and nothing I could do about it. Uh, I was in the military and so I was going to go ahead and do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I was too young to get scared. <coughs> so um, you chose the Navy. Um, was there any particular reason uh, you picked the Navy? Or? My father was in the Navy in World War I, and he was a radioman, so I thought I'd take the same steps and go in the Navy. Wow. And I'm thankful I did. <laughs>
So I'm um, studying to be a radio man. What exactly did you? What exactly did you have to study as a radio man? Well, you had to learn. It. Well, first of all, you better know typing, mm -hmm. which I had in high school. And uh, you start out with, I guess, around five words a minute, and you learn that, and then you go to the next step up. And you had to get 12 words a minute before you could graduate. If you didn't, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, most the people that didn't make that ended up going in uh, shipboard as a shipboard sailor, not a radio man. But I graduated. And my buddy wanted to go to aviation, but I wanted to go to a fast destroyer PT boat. But I went to aviation with him. That's that's pretty cool. Though. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, did you have to learn something like Morse, Morse code? Because obviously, through the radio, you got to do more than just type and whatnot. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> of course, it was radio silence. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was up in Aleutian Islands, they broadcasted the weather every hour, mm -hmm. and you had to copy it. And uh, when I got out in, in the Navy Liberators, uh, we didn't do that. It was completely radio silence unless you had a contact of a task force or airplanes and so forth. And the only time I sent a message is I was a, on a ferry crew that went to Hawaiian Islands to pick up a Navy Liberator and fly to the States. And the weather was bad. And I had to open up and get our position report. <clears throat> That's the only message I ever sent. So, did you serve in the Pacific or in Europe? Pacific only. Pacific only. North and Lucian Islands and South Pacific. So, through the Navy, you flew, correct? Pardon? Through the Navy, you did you fly a plane or? Well, I was a radioman. I flew in a, the Navy Liberator. I, mm -hmm. I flew over. Uh, Sixteen hundred hours in the Navy, mm -hmm. in over a hundred reconnaissance missions, which is flying over hundreds of miles of ocean all the time, mm -hmm. between Aleutian Islands and South Pacific. Other than being a radio man, did you have any other duties you had to um, do? No, we didn't have any other duties. Uh, uh, the day before you flew, you went down and checked out your airplane for the gas load and. Um, ammunition and so forth. In some of the islands, we didn't have any ground, uh, ground crew. We had to fuel our own airplanes and, and uh, ammunition. And when you took off, you usually test fired your 50 caliber machine guns and so forth. And, and one time coming back off a of patrol, we landed on this island and no sooner got down and the Japanese fighters came in on the harbor and started shooting it up. And as the airplane stopped, we got out of it, <coughs> out of it and run into a revetment. It was full of 100 pound, I mean, 500 pound bombs. <laughs> but we didn't have any problem. Yeah. So you flew several recon missions. Um, did you have to fly any bombing missions at all? Or? Yeah, one island, usually on a sector, if there was an island the Japanese had uh, on coming back on that particular uh, sector, uh, we were flying at 10,000 feet. Well, he would come down to about maybe 500 feet or less and go across an island. Mm -hmm. This particular island, I was in the top turret, and it was a... a um, lighthouse and they had a machine gun in there and that's what I was shooting at and we dropped we dropped our bombs. Now the Navy Liberator had gas tanks in the forward bomb bays and we had our bombs in the after bomb bays and that's what we dropped. I could see that machine gun winking at me. <laughs> you did fly in the Navy Liberators. Did you um, later fly in the privateers? I flew it in once. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came back to the United States, I rated shore duty. Mm -hmm. 
Of all places they sent me was St. Nicholas Island, which is about 50 miles off the coast of California. So I got a hold of the personnel officer of the squadron I was in mm -hmm. and asked him, he can't do that to me after spending a year up in Aleutian Islands and eight months in the South Pacific, I'd like to see the mainland. Yeah. So he transferred, transferred me to Terminal Island Air Station, which is by Long Beach and so forth. Back during the war, um, other than reconnaissance missions and uh, whatnot, how exactly was it really serving in the war? Like, is there any ex specific experiences that stand out to you? Or? Well, uh, we were on a reconnaissance mission, and we're coming home, and it was, it was overcast. This is South Pacific, it was overcast, which was unusual. And the people in the uh, gunner in the after station spotted this airplane going the other way. Mm -hmm. And it happened to be a Japanese bomber. I'm trying to think, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, the pilot did a 180 and poured the coal to it and we snuck up on it. Mm -hmm. And we got just below the overcast and the airplane was down below there. Mm -hmm. And he tipped the nose down and the bow gunner and I shot at, mm -hmm. and I couldn't have shot more than 50 rounds, and they went in the water. Japanese airplanes did not have bulletproof gas tanks. And uh, they there. went, yeah, they went down really. And another time we were flying off an island, oh, I can't think of it, but we were about 600 miles southeast of the Philippines, and we were flying, I would say, west or southwest and we would see fighter airplanes, Japanese fighter airplanes, but they would never close. Mm -hmm. And one day we were flying that same mission and we saw two battleships and a cruiser and four destroyers. Thank God, no carrier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, I was up in the turrets and of course the radarman sent a contact report and we come on in. Mm -hmm. And that particular day, it was quite unusual and well, we took off late and was coming in just about dark. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and when you approached an island, they had a, a uh, you had to circle reader right or left before you came in the landing. Nice. So we were coming in the landing and we no sooner stopped at the end of the runway and we had a, a alert, a Japanese fighter came over and he was shooting up the uh, wharf area we jumped out of the airplane and run for ref revetment, like I said earlier, and it was f had 500 bomb bombs in there, of all places to be. Yikes. But living conditions in the South Pacific we always lived in tents, and mm -hmm. some of them are more improved than others, and we ate with the CBs of the Army or somebody. And it was different. I figured to get in the aviation or in the Navy, I'd have a, a clean bed and uh, three square meals a day. <laughs> Are there any other experiences um, during your time in the Navy that stand out uh, as well on that, or, or are those the only Well, no, I, well, uh, there was one uh, uh, station at Mojave, California. Well, backing up, when I was uh, stationed at Thermo, California, uh, I had to stand an OD watch, and a fire alert went out. And I looked, well, I couldn't do anything. I had to stay there, but my barracks was burning. Oh. It burned down and I lost all my clothes. <laughs> Yikes, but I got, tra <coughs> from there, the war ended, and I got transferred to NAS Mojave, California. And uh, I was allowed to get a full sea bag of new clothes. Mm -hmm. So we got in this JRB and flew down to San Diego and I got my clothes. Mm -hmm. And coming back, uh, they had this model of a battleship out on the desert made out of the metal that we used on airstrips. And the pilot wanted to go down and take a look. And I was sitting in the after part of the airplane and watching the pilot. And he took her down and I could see the co-pilot wanted to grab the handle. But you could count every hole, I think, in that battleship that was that metal. The metal had holes in it. and. Uh, and we got home safely. <laughs> but there were experiences like that occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, before I got in Navy Liberators, mm -hmm. we had to go to a school. Mm -hmm. And it was down to Sa San Diego, North Island, and it was put on by um, consolidated people. Right. And they, like radiomen, they would take uh, you through the radio section, and uh, ordnance men, they'd take through the. But we had to go to a pressure chamber mm -hmm. where they took you up to 18,000 feet. First of all, you went in the pressure chamber, you sat down and you took you up to 18,000 feet and you had to take a test. And then they took you up to 22 or 23,000 feet and, and of course you had to put your oxygen on and that. Right. But they had uh, uh, Mex I mean uh, Cor Corman in there watching you to make sure that, the, but that was quite an experience, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and then uh, we were training in, in the Navy Liberators. We'd go up to uh, Auxiliary Airfield and do bounce drill. We'd land and, mm -hmm. and taxi down and back up and take off and land and things like that. And then over in the White Islands when we were training, we did gunnery. Uh, we shot at tow targets. Mm -hmm. In one instant, they had a uh, fighter pilot making runs on us. And sitting in the top turret, watching that, that fighter pilot come by, I swear I could, that thing it was really huge. He come by the tail and went right on boy. It really scared the heck out of me. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, but we did bombing and so forth like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, most of the time was, well, it was real nice. We island hopped down to the South Pacific and island hopped back. and. Thing. It was a great career. I enjoyed it as a young man. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds yeah. really interesting. Yeah. I bet it was. Yeah, yeah um, on the Lucian Islands, well, all we did is reconnaissance. We'd fly a sector and come back and so forth like that. Mm -hmm. Well, one day we was flying and you flow low and it was either a destroyer or a cruise of, I think it was a destroyer. He turned on his blinker and was blinking at us. And so the so pilot went around. Well, backing up a little bit, in radio school, the signalman used to be up on a balcony with the blinkers, and us radiomen would, would copy what they were saying. And of course, the first radioman didn't know blinker. And of course, I had it in, in uh, a little bit in the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. And so I was back in the after station, and we had a 50 caliber, which we had armor plating on it. And I was copying on that. And we'd go around, and he would ask if we would land, and then I'd lose part of it. And then we'd go around again. And it, uh, uh, what it was, they had a sick man aboard where we'd land and pick him up. Mm -hmm. And the pilot said, okay, and I'd give him a roger, and we'd come in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we landed in the ocean, and we bounced nine times getting down, and those PBYs sit pretty low in the water. <clears throat> and they brought them out in a whale boat or something, and we put them aboard. We had four bunks in a few while, and we put them in that. Mm -hmm. And taken off was quite a, quite a deal. And the pilots sit up there, and both of them, they push it forward and pull it back. They're breaking a suction on the hull. Mm -hmm. And there is a step in there, and they'd pull it back. And then they'd push it, and they'd pull it back, and we're doing this. And we bounced about nine times getting off. Things are like that, you know. Oh, another thing in the South Pacific. Uh -huh. Usually you go down and you check the airplane out. I mean, the mechs check and we check our ammunition and all that. And, and then we run the props through before they turn it up. And mm -hmm. So we're taking off and we're streaming gas out of the trailing edge. Yikes. And even <coughs> we shut down everything and we make a circle come around and land. Some mech checked the gas up in the gas tanks, but forgot to secure the the cap on them. Thank God we didn't blow up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's real scary. That's yeah, probably yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's what a lot of things you know you had happen and so forth like that. And mm -hmm. But it, we had a great crew and nice guys and so forth. You know. yeah. Proud to serve. Yeah. <laughs> How do you remember the day of Japan's surrender? When Tojo finally said, I give up, that sort of thing. 
I think I was married then, and I think I was driving back. I was actually stationed out at Thermo, California, was auxiliary air station where they trained fighter pilots and torpedo pilots. And the fighter pilots had to know a certain amount of Morse code, which I and another guy, uh, another sailor, I had classes in code for the, the pilots. And I was driving back to see my wife when uh, Pearl Harbor happened. And I was just happy the war was over. Well, I'm sure. It's, yeah. yeah, it was a really brutal conflict. Um, after World War II, did you serve in uh, any more any more of our nation's wars? Or? Well, after World War, well, actually, I didn't get out until January 20, January, the January, January 47, because oh, right. I was on a six-year six hitch, six. yeah. And I went to work for the Naval Missile Center, Point Magoo. It's, uh, it was very crude then, and uh, I worked on the airstrip at that time. And then I stayed there for 30 years, and I retired in, in uh, 1976, January 1976. Well, that must have been... <laughs> yeah. did, you did you feel good that you finally... Uh was able to retire, or was it sort of? Oh yeah, I was happy. We, we were in square dancing and round dancing, and mm -hmm. and uh, our kids were growing and that. So we ended up in Oregon. Uh, speaking of, speaking of which, um, how did you find Josephine County? How what? How did you find Josephine County here, Oregon? In Oregon? Yeah. Uh, my wife's sister and husband lived up here, and we decided to move up here. Yeah. How do you like it here? Pretty nice. Yeah. It's better in Los Angeles or Southern California. Yeah. Well, right, because there's all the hustle and bustle. The well, there's too many people now. Yeah. It was nice back in 19, I mean, in the 70s and 80s. Right. <coughs> and a bunch of congestion yeah. and stuff down there. Um, but the, uh, how has it really been settling down as a veteran? Uh, I've lived a normal life. I haven't had any problems. Uh, I can say we were in square dancing, we taught war on dancing, and mm -hmm. I didn't belong to any of the uh, military, I mean the organizations like the American Legion or anything like that. Uh, I just didn't uh, turn me on, to tell you the truth. What, again? what exactly did you do at uh, Point Magoo? Point Magoo? Yeah. Well, first of all, I worked on the air station, and I don't know, two, three years, and they run all the civilians off the airstrip. And I went to a program, it was an experimental program. I had two transmitters on a mountain that was just back at Point Magoo <coughs> that I had to go up every day. And they had receiving stations up and down the coast and out on some of the Channel Islands. And all I had to do is go up there. It had a timing center with things with WWV in Washington, D.C. and turn the transmitters on and then they did their thing and turn them off and come off the hill. And then from there, I went to a called a standards lab uh, where we calibrated, calibrated attenuators in the microwave regions and so forth, and also worked on antenna rings. And from there, I went to um, what we call radar backscattering. Uh, we had a temporary chamber in one of the buildings, back of the buildings, or you'd put a missile on a on a pedestal and you'd sink you have two antennas mm -hmm. that you would have an attenuator and a, oh, I forget what the other thing, but you the crosstalk between the two you'd zero out and then you measure the reflection off the object that was rotating around right. maybe fifty feet or twenty feet or something. But they built a great big building that we uh, moved into that w improved the situation that we had there. And uh, you recorded on a photo recorder or rectangular recorder. And, and that's where I retired from. Quite an experience. I flew on B-25s, uh, uh, torpedo bombers. I flew on that. Uh, 
In fact, the Mojave, we had about two or three of every aircraft the Navy had, uh, plus some of the Army aircraft. Like I say, I had over 1,600 hours flying and 100 reconnaissance missions, but of course I didn't count all my, <clears throat> but it was a great life. Yeah. <laughs> I got uh, two DFCs and seven air medals and a bunch of other glory bars. It's, that's nice. It's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I feel, yeah. feel very blessed because I married that young lady floating around over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, married her January twenty fifth, nineteen forty five. She was mm -hmm. she was nineteen and I was twenty one, mm -hmm. and we went down to the was in Los Angeles. Went down to City Hall to get her marriage license, mm -hmm. and they asked me for identification, not her, mm -hmm. and it cost two dollars for a marriage license then. You've had a really great life in life. So <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so you served in the Navy, you served your country, and that's, that's yeah. really, that's really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. So had a great career, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Most of all, he enjoyed his service. Well, it actually gave me an occupation because I went to work for the Navy and so mm -hmm. forth in electronics and. <clears throat> back in the vacuum two days now it blows my mind <laughs> yeah. especially with that new laptop computer <laughs> yeah. Mr. Adair certainly showed the ups and downs of serving his country you can have great times in the service but very few people go through the service without a close call or two especially in times of war particularly World War II truth is everyday great Americans are everywhere out in the community and in your neighborhoods Everyone has done something great in their lives, and it's a good thing to share those experiences with friends and family. I'm Jonathan Christensen of Boy Scout Troop 122, and for the Josephine County Historical Society, it's been my pleasure to present to you these stories of everyday great Americans. Yeah.